Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, as stated, I work at Secret Location, uh, which has been acquired by Entertainment One. And uh, over the last uh, three years, we've been working uh, extensively in virtual reality, working on uh, horror and experiential uh, experiences, um, uh, documentary, and, uh, and other types of things, uh, art, music, that sort of thing. Uh, but traditionally and historically, we've been a digital studio outside of VR. Obviously, VR is a nascent technology. It's not what we started working in eight years ago. Uh, and what we used to do, uh, and what we're doing a lot less of now, is WebGL, um, a lot of mobile apps, uh, and a lot of uh, sort of marketing experiences, uh, predominantly for the entertainment industry here in Canada and in the States. Um, but a, over a year ago, we just started developing an original property. Uh, it wasn't our first, uh, but it would be a giant step uh, for, for what's essentially a, a web-based creative agency. Uh, and that was a short-form, multi-platform science fiction series uh, called Halcyon. Uh, and it's a police procedural that unfolds across multiple planes of reality uh, with episodes alternating between live action and real time. Now, how this all got started uh, we were approached by Sci-Fi International with a problem. You see, when they take their uh, import or import their content from North America, from Sci-Fi, the, the parent channel, um, they often get these uh, three to five minute gaps in uh, programming schedules. So what they were looking for was uh, linear content that they could use in broadcast to fill those gaps, uh, but they saw an opportunity here to, to experiment with uh, digital properties and do something that was digital first. So we had brainstorms and we came up with some ideas. Uh, and we pitched this one concept that involved uh, interactive real-time episodes in VR that would uh, couple with linear live, ac live action episodes for broadcast on the web. Uh, and virtual reality seemed like a really perfect fit for uh, a, basically a science fiction cable channel. I mean, they were really interested in the technology. They thought this was something that their audience would be really interested in exploring. Um, and while we've done a lot of short experiential VR, we were really interested in exploring uh, different formats and specifically uh, scripted episodic content. So speaking of episodes, uh, we started to devise this structure that incorporated the live action content with the real time. The idea was that both were integral to the series narrative uh, and the VR wasn't meant to be just a marketing activation separate from the main story, but actually be an immersive extension to the plot. Uh, and I'll get back to the problems that that started to create. Uh, but one of the first things that we realized uh, was that uh, we did some research and, and had to consider the fact that the audience, Sci-Fi's audience, uh, although they were often early adopters of technology, uh, not all of them would be people who have picked up VR at this point. Uh, and we needed to ensure that those live action episodes could carry the story for those who didn't have access to a VR headset. Um, this was just one of the, the first of many sort of uh, revelations that we had about how we needed to keep things simple. And uh, John earlier from Global Core was talking about that and how to keep your experiences simple and this was something that we really took to heart early on in, this, in the sort of development phase of this project. And so one of the first decisions that we made was uh, that we were going to pick something that was familiar to the audience. So we knew that introducing them to um, new ideas in script, new ideas in platforms and interface uh, was going to be pretty heavy and hard for them to sort of grasp, especially those who hadn't tried VR before. Um, so we grounded the audience in the story structure that, that was, was simple. Like They would see this and they'd say, this is Benson and Stabler in VR. This is what Law and Order would look like if I was participating in it. So we had this idea that uh, agency, giving the audience control over the story is, is amazing, but we realized that at this point uh, in our pipeline, and in their sort of acceptance of what's novel and what's familiar, uh, this might be a step too far. Uh, it's something that we, we, we initially can consider, but we came into concerns specifically because uh, giving the audience control over the story outcomes uh, means that every subsequent linear live action episode would have to take into account all those possible endings. And when you have branching narrative like this, uh, things very quickly tend to spiral out of scope. So knowing what we had, what our budget was and what our timeline was, we knew that this was something that we wouldn't be able to uh, accommodate. We just honestly didn't have the funds to shoot additional takes of live action episodes with actors and a set and uh, a crew uh, to accommodate for any kind of changes to the storyline. 
So essentially, we decided to stick to a traditional linear model, even for the interactive episodes, and make those interactive episodes more about exploring the space and getting people familiar and comfortable with VR. Um, this actually also helped fix that uh, issue with the audience that, was, uh, that didn't have access to the VR headsets, uh, essentially because we knew the predetermined outcomes of every interactive episode, so therefore what we could do is create these uh, natural recaps in following linear apps. Uh, and that way we were ensuring that key information was being uh, communicated to the audience. Uh, so linear narrative definitely helped us keep the scope down. Um, now, we had other options. We didn't have to necessarily go into linear, but um, honestly, that's a massive topic uh, that I love to talk about, but I think that's a, a topic for uh, another day. Uh, so aside from story concerns, we also had to deal with the, the realities of, the, uh, of publishing for a platform that's nascent. Uh, at this point, there was no uh, commercial release yet for the uh, Oculus Rift. So we, were, we understood when the release was coming, but, um, but it was still um, just months before when we needed to release our first episodes. Uh, so that was causing some concern. We didn't know whether or not they would push their release, uh, and we sort of uh, you know, went on it with faith. Um, but we just didn't have any control over it, and we knew for sure that, that the uh, Oculus Touch handsets or hand controllers uh, would most likely get pushed, would most, and because there was no, no confirmed date or even speculated date at this point, uh, we decided that there was just no way that we could um, uh, work towards having those included into launch. Um, and beyond that, uh, we, uh, we realized that the success of the Gear VR and the promotional power that Samsung was putting behind this headset, uh, we needed to port our Rift experience to take advantage of their growing user base. So this would provo uh, prove to be a big part of the success of, of Halcyon, but again, it was also another strain on a very meager budget. Uh, so we knew we had to uh, create all new interface for the, the Samsung Gear VR, obviously, because it has very different uh, demands. Um, but back to content, we, uh, at Super Location, we see a lot of potential for virtual reality, and we didn't just want to deliver a project that was uh, uh, viewable or consumed in, in VR, we also wanted it to be about VR. Uh, we discussed a lot of the known issues surrounding VR. We extrapolated our own as well. We're constantly talking about this stuff at work. I'm sure everybody else here is the same. Uh, and we didn't want to come across as, as too pro or con virtual reality or get too preachy, but we really did want to explore sort of like a gamut of what's potential in VR, both good and bad. So we spent a few months developing the concept, and we went through synopsis and character sketches, uh, log lines, scripts, uh, and constantly talking about what kind of um, themes and what kind of issues we wanted to tackle. And at the same time, we were starting to develop what our um, interactive episodes could look like. So the crime scene investigation was one of the first ideas, and it reigns, remains intact in the final product, but we also had this idea about interrogations, and we thought it would be really interesting to interrogate a character in VR. Um, now, it was in, mentioned earlier that we worked on Sleepy Hollow, uh, and that was a project where we actually filmed an actor using stereoscopic uh, cameras, two GoPros, um, back in 2013. Um, and we discovered a lot of issues that sort of arise with trying to put a, uh, a shot character from a green screen into a CG environment. Uh, so the knowledge that we gained from Sleepy and also from Insidious VR, which is another project that we, we worked on, uh, we looked at how we could overcome those limitations and create something where we could actually film an actor and put them into this interrogation scene. So we made it a seated experience so that we could get closer to our subject and we didn't have to show their entire body because they were seated across from you at a table. Uh, we talked about adding glitches and making the character not someone who is uh, like a, a human. That you're not sp the, the conceit is not that you're talking to another human being in a room, but that you're talking to something that's a hologram. Uh, and then uh, also on top of that, this sort of like stylized unreal characters in their voice so that we could have those glitches that would um, mask moments where we were skipping video to sort of do like a, basically a choose your own adventure. So this was something that we talked about. Uh, we sort of theorized it. We paper prototyped it. Um, we, we, we uh, had this whole treatment written about these ideas of these cognitive copies, these, um, these hologram characters. Uh, but in the end, again, budget was a thing that came up, and we realized that this was, uh, was something that was going to be very expensive to do, uh, and it was much easier for us to, to focus on the crime scene investigation and not have two locations. So while interrogation scenes that we had planned for never really made it into the interactive episodes, um, you know, we're still looking at that as a, something potential that we could explore for uh, either future episodes or for a future project. 
Now, at the same time, we're developing these concepts for what the, the story is going to be like and what the experience is going to be like. We start working on visual design. Uh, and we started throwing things around and talking about it, and we came up with this sort of like 80s neon uh, influence that we thought would be really interesting. Uh, it was very colorful, and we thought it'd be fun. And then we, uh, we wanted to add some atmosphere, uh, so we took some uh, direct inspiration from film noir. Uh, specifically, the lighting and the mood. When we matched those two things together, we got this thing that we were calling neon noir. And we were really excited about this look, and it's very dark on these screens, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, like there's a lot of bright, vibrant colors, a lot of dark um, areas of light and pools of light. Sorry, dark areas of shadow, <laughs> not dark areas of light. Um, anyway, so this was sort of our, our idea moving forward. And remember, we're creating, we were creating a, uh, basically a, a, an episode of television. It was going to be about an hour of content. <clears throat> so like any episode of TV, we had to find our locations. So pre-production was already underway. Uh, we started lo scouting locations. We started coming up with ideas. Some of these, th this is sort of from our, our document for mood boards, for things that we wanted to have for locations. Uh, and some of them we got, like uh, in the top right corner, is that's uh, Red Bull's offices here in Toronto. And we actually knew people there. So we got their space, which was awesome. Uh, and then some of them we, bi we built, like the lower left, that's these uh, weird Japanese pod uh, apartments, so we actually built a set that looked like that, and you can see that in this next slide. So there we are in the top right at, at Red Bull, in the bottom left, that's us in our, our set of a pod apartment. Um, but one of the things that we realized was that this neon noir look was going to be massively expensive to do. We had a very small crew, we had limited, uh, limited time on our sets, uh, so, and we just didn't have the art department on the, on the live action side to be able to handle the type of um, dedication and work that was going to be needed to do this in such a very short sprint. We were dealing with a very, very small budget here. Like, this is, this is like to put it into perspective, uh, we basically had one fifth of what you would find on any modest television show episode. Uh, and that money uh, had to go into things like talent and crew. The locations, the logistics, set building, props, art, and basically everything that you would find in a normal television show. But then on top of that, uh, we also had to build an entire VR experience for the Oculus Rift, uh, staff up for that, that experience, port it to the Ge Gear VR, uh, and then also the percentage of that went into promotion. So what we ended up with was we just need to scale back. We need to find something that works within our pipeline and uh, then we aim to do the same thing with the real-time episodes. So one of the things that we did is we, we tried to address this in story. So originally, uh, we, and this is something that has remained intact, the idea of virtual reality in our story in 2040 is that headsets are out and nanotech is in. So everything that the users who, who are in VR in, in our story experience, they, it's in mind. It's basically technology that is inside of them. It's like transhumanism, that sort of thing. And the original idea was that we're going to have this neon noir world out in the real world. And what we were going to do for virtual reality was have this sort of um, place that is surreal yet realistically portrayed and comes like from memories or dreams of the, of the people who have the, uh, the implants. So something that's more organic and natural and less digital like Tron or uh, The Matrix. <clears throat> so in order to, in uh, to facilitate that, we need to have really great uh, performance capture because we were planning on doing this real-time um, rendered. So, but we wanted our actors to look real and to get like a great performance capture. So we developed this technique uh, that resulted in some really hyper-realistic looking characters. Uh, so in the bottom right there, you can see a little insert of uh, our actor who, while we, we captured his performance, which is just literally him choking to death. Spoiler alert. Um, and this, this in, the, in the large picture, that's, that's the actual 3D model. So we were getting really good results. However, uh, when we were testing with just one character in scene, uh, because it's virtual reality, we have to keep it at 90 frames per second over two eyes. And that meant that we had uh, 90 materials per frame, uh, which is 180 per second. And running on our spec system, that basically resulted in an overheated GPU in only 10 seconds of footage, which really isn't enough time to deliver a performance of any kind of meaning. 
so this was one of the first major setbacks that we had where, where, where our conceit in our story and in our style was challenged by the technology. So we did what we always do, we iterate. Uh, we had some discussions over how we could pivot both the real-time VR episodes and linear scenes that showed our protagonists in the virtual crime scene. And we explored this idea of virtual bodies, which is sort of like low poly. Uh, we, just, we talked about just doing voiceover, and we talked about this weird sort of like hybrid idea of voyeurs where there's these giant video heads that are watching the VR scene while you're in it. And then we started looking at different stylistic approaches uh, that maybe wouldn't require as heavy a load on the performance capture. Maybe we didn't need to capture it like we were doing uh, with, the, with the technique we had developed. Uh, so we just went to the web and started to find some interesting sort of like stylistic approaches. Um, because we work iteratively, we were able to prototype a few of these uh, while um, the development into other parts of the project were still underway. And then when we started finding the ones that we thought were promising, uh, we went back to the drawing board and, and concepted those to see what we could do and work with our artists to, to end up with something that fit into the world. And ultimately, the aesthetic choices that we made were not only, sol uh, not only solved this issue, but the audience would never have suspected that they came from you know, a desire to cut corners because we made them stylistically and we made them fit into the world. Um, but that's, that's the issue, is like they had to fit into what we were doing. So uh, we, had to, we had to change the rest of the look and feel. So budgetary constraints on the shoot and technical challenges for the real-time development uh, put an end to this neon noir aesthetic. So instead, we swapped styles between the real world and the virtual. So the dreamlike memory world, which would have required extremely realistic models of the crime scene environment, um, which you can see here on the left, uh, that's, that's actually a, a recreation of our crime scene, of the, the set we were in. Um, we removed that need, so we redesigned the space to look more abstract and more digital. But the story had to change, too. Like we had said that the conceit was that uh, th these are people's memories or their dreams, but now we were, we're talking more about making these digital. So the idea was that this was a digital reconstruction created for the police detectives to solve crimes in VR. And so because our virtual environments became more vibrant and more colorful, we still wanted to keep that sort of duality and change the, uh, the neon noir in the, in, the, in the real world. Again, also budgetary constraints forced us to do that. So we lost that look, um, and the live action episodes took on more of a straightforward look to balance out that supersaturation. Uh, so Halcyon isn't just uh, the title of the series, it's also the name of a global corporation uh, within the world of the show. And again, unlike John's comments about Global Core, um, Halcyon is actually one of those megacorps that are bent on world domination. They just don't want you to know it. Uh, so early on, we looked at the possibility of funding the project through brand sponsorships, uh, and we would have peppered the episodes with ads for these futurized brands. Uh, but as we moved into post-production, we had to rein in our VFX team uh, to focus on the elements that would have, have more, uh, like the biggest impact in, into, the, into the show, and that was the in-world uh, user interface. Again, these were budgetary constraints and just things like deadlines and, and working with the technology. And conversely, we had also hoped that um, we could have like a, an ad campaign in our real world for, for Halcyon, sort of um, promoting the show before it was released. And these mock-ups were meant for television, publishing, and out of home. And the design spoke to many of the concepts and the applications that uh, we discuss at SL and our thoughts of where our VR could actually go, both good and bad. And one of the things I liked about these was that um, you know, they display the virtues of nanotech VR, but also have this sort of possible hint of darkness just underneath the surface. Um, it would be a subtle tie into the show world and would also allow us to talk about the greater world of the show that's hinted at in our pilot content. So one of the things that was interesting is um, for funding purposes, we created a short concept video uh, in, in the form of a House Corporation ad. And I know Stephen Bosco is gonna hate me for showing this, uh, but I'm gonna do it anyways. And here we go. With the Virtue headset, we've reimagined our VR hardware from the ground up to create a virtual experience so lifelike it's indistinguishable from reality. Our predictive gigapixel display delivers crystalline visuals at a refresh rate faster than the human eye. And polyfilament fibers embedded in a nano carbon shell produce the most progressive latency scaling ever achieved. The result is total freedom in the virtual space. And the final evolution of VR. We're Halcyon, and we invite you. To 
stick that was made in one and a half days. So it was very quick. Most of our um, pr time in production was was kind of sort of shotgun approach like that. We just we just need to get things done, so we just did them. Um, so continuing on about uh, advertising, and I'm, there's going to be a lot of time for questions afterwards, and I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, social campaign. So we never got to make those fake Halcyon ads, but we did have time and money for a real-life social campaign uh, as perpetuated by Blake Creighton, who was um, our character who you saw um, getting virtually strangled. Um, he's the character who founded the company Halcyon, and we created this, this account as if he was a, a college uh, uh, sophomore in 2016 coming up with his first headset and I even had this really s strangely meta conversation with a character I created over Twitter so that was kind of bizarre um, and we were also we also took part in the first uh, VR press junket which was hosted by Altspace and NBC Universal uh, which was an interesting event um, it, which has actually gone on to to win some um, uh, marketing awards uh, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting thing. We got to sit in the space, and it was myself, uh, the director, uh, uh, Ben Arfman, and Harveen, who plays uh, one of our characters, Asha, and we just answered questions to uh, journalists from around the world who came into alt space and were able to, to talk to us in these like avatars. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Sci-Fi International actually took on a lot of the marketing and promotion of the project, and they really liked that prototype ad so much uh, that they, uh, they wanted to recreate it for the promotion in in their foreign territory. So uh, you just saw our version, which took uh, a couple of days, a day and a half, and now you're going to see the one that we got from, from Sci-Fi, which they, they put considerable more time and effort into, but it's still based on our idea, so we're proud of it. A new reality in VR has arrived. The next generation it's very of entertainment is not immersion. It's seamless integration. The next generation of headsets is not virtual, it's sensory realization. The next generation is Halcyon. Virtual is real. Break through into a new era with freedom of movement, unlimited power, and intuitive controls. Experience the optical leap with field of view wider than the human eye. Enter a new world. It's the dawn of a new reality. Halcyon. Virtual is real. So there were a few uh, comments where people were asking if this was real, and a lot of people sort of trying to tear apart the, the tech specs of this <laughs> proposed headset. Um, <laughs> Which is surprising, considering that it was on a channel called the Halcyon VR series. I think I would have thought that would have given it away, but all right. Um, well, it's great that people thought were fooled and thought it was real. Uh, now, earlier I mentioned that Halcyon was uh, what we considered to be uh, pilot content, which is really how we thought about the project from its initial stages right through into post-production. And it goes along with a lot of what um, Alan was saying earlier, uh, that looking at VR right now and looking at VR, uh, VR content creation as, as a means to, to sort of make money uh, is, is difficult. Um, but it's still possibly be done. And yes, you can do it if you get funding and if you get bought by E1. Um, but the idea is that it's about play right now. It's about trying to build up enough experience and expertise uh, so that when this does become a, uh, a market that is, uh, is something that is monetizable or, or, or monetizable to the point where you can actually keep your company afloat, uh, then you'll have that, that, that edge up. And so for now, we're trying to do these simple, smaller pieces that sort of are, are proofs of concept and, and then can be used to sell through larger ideas. Um, so for instance, uh, Halcyon was launched uh, in late September into a f on Sci-Fi International into foreign markets. So it's around the world, but it's no, not in North America yet. We are working on trying to get that kind of deal, and there should probably be announcement sometime later this month. 
Uh, but we're also looking at how we can further develop it, like whether or not we could bring it to TV as a large series or whether or not we want to do something where it becomes like a, a, a reoccurring sort of episodic thing on, on Steam or, or Oculus or maybe even bring it to PlayStation 4. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's considering where Secret Location stood um, when Develop began on this project and where we now stand post-launch, I think we've managed to sort of like hit that goal of being able to um, take that giant leap and, and that step into uh, new content creation. And we're really excited about where our next projects are going to go. Uh, so one last thing, speaking of next projects, uh, a completely different VR project is Blasters of the Universe. It's a VR game we have out on Steam in early access. Uh, it's a room-scale shooter of the bullet hell ilk, if you are familiar with those. It's uh, very physical. You've got to move around a lot to dodge those bullets. Uh, it's managed to keep part of that halcyon neon noir look that we had uh, developed early on and had to let go. Uh, and then it injects a heavy dose of comedy through the form of this man-child with a god complex who's sort of like the main antagonist in the series. So both um, Blasters and Halcyon were demoing just at the end of this hallway, if you want to check them out. Uh, and uh, actually that is the end of the presentation. I do have one more video. Uh, before we get to questions. And this video is just going to be a behind the scenes of some of the uh, cast and crew, uh, and you'll see some of the sets and you'll see some of the parts uh, inside of Halcyon. So if you don't have time to check it out today, this will give you a little taste of what it's like. We are creating a world. It's gonna be in between an interactive movie and a little bit of a video game. There's nothing else that's doing anything like this right now. The story of Halcyon follows Julie Dover, who is a detective of virtual reality crime. We're far enough in the future that something really interesting is happening, but not so far that we can't relate. Halcyon is this large VR company. We find out there's a murder right at the start. It's a murder that takes place in virtual reality that really shouldn't have happened in the first place. The story itself is going to really appeal to people who love a good plot, a good mystery, a good thriller. I don't understand. How do you strangle a man without leaving a single mark? There's going to be traditional linear broadcast episodes and outside of that VR episodes to further experience the world of Halcyon through using the Oculus Rift or the Samsung Gear VR. You put on the Oculus Rift, you put on the headset, and you'll suddenly appear inside a 3D model of one of our key sets. There'll be a viewing room, which will mimic the crime scene, and you'll be able to watch episodes on a large screen, and it'll be like having a large screen at home. But when the VR episodes start, that environment will actually transform into the crime scene itself and will allow the users to walk around and interact with objects in that crime scene. You can explore, move around the world, interact with objects, you're picking up clues, physical objects, you're tracing fingerprints, and helping the main characters solve the crime in the story. Great. That glass had an intact, clear print. Perfect. So let's filter out all matching prints. Halcyon is a hybrid series, which means that it's going to live on the web, uh, in VR, and in part on broadcast. It's going to be broadcast on network, also available online, but part of the series also exists entirely in virtual reality. And it's going to be linear episodes and VR episodes. Within those VR episodes, the user is going to have agency to explore the world at their own and learn extra backstory. So instead of just being an observer, I think now we've found a way to kind of immerse the actual audience in with us. What do we got? It's bridging the gap between being just a passive audience member and an active participant in a story, which is just, it's incredibly unique. There's nothing else that's doing anything like this right now. Oh, wow. Now we're getting somewhere. And thanks. That's it. So if you have any questions about Secret Location, about Halcyon, or how we work in VR, um, please put your hands up. And if not, then there's more time to try out demos. All right. Oh. Right. 
So the question is, uh, did we find uh, uh, techniques that for creating story in VR that were different from how we would do them in film, and what did we find successful? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, approaching VR like you would approach film I is difficult because um, we rely so much on cinematography uh, to tell a story in VR, and that, that can work when you're doing uh, stuff that's shot in camera. But when, it, when a project comes into SL and someone says, we're doing a VR project for a client X, I, I'm waiting with bated breath to find out more about that project because I have two completely different groups that are going to be working on this. I either have a crew with a camera that's going to have to find locations and, and actors and go out and film it, or I have a bunch of developers and artists who are going to be building this stuff in a real-time engine. And those things are so different that I'm starting to realize that there's, there's, a, there's a gulf between these two types of VR experiences. Now, augmented reality and mixed reality have done a very good job of sort of separating and letting people understand which is which, uh, but in VR, we haven't really done that yet. Um, and while cinematography um, may still apply in some respects to the sort of filmed, the cinematic VR, I think for the spatial or interactive VR, it, it, it breaks. Like, there's, there's no way to, to tell a story visually uh, consistently where you know where your audience is going to be. So we do a lot of things, and I mean, we take a lot from video games and more from video games than we do from, from film. It's like tell the story in the environment. They've been doing this since the first Half-Life. You know, voiceover works really well because it doesn't matter where I'm looking, I can get a voiceover from someone, and that's why we ended up going with voiceover characters in the VR scene. Uh, and we just, because nobody knows our characters, we, we kept that visual prompt up so that people would know who's talking to them. It's much easier when, when it's like actors that you, you recognize their voices and you know who their characters are. Um, but from an actual like story building perspective, uh, we found that uh, the simpler the story, like we didn't want to make this a, um, a mystery. Because if we, had, if we had made it something where you were trying to, to figure out who, who the murderer was, but you were doing it by going between two different formats of episodes, it gets too complicated for people. And I don't think that we're at that point yet where the, the audience is, is sophisticated enough, or the general population isn't sophisticated enough to, to be able to follow that. Um, and that's not, that's not as a, I'm not saying that to be, to be cruel or mean, but it's just we all have a lot of experience in VR when we've been working in it. Uh, like there were hands going up earlier about everyone who's working in VR, uh, on VR projects. And we tend to forget that we've learned a lot and we've used this stuff a lot and we know what to expect and we know what's possible or what to do. But I mean, you give someone a controller who's never even tr played an Xbox game before and you put them in VR and they'll sit there and ask you, what am I supposed to do? Um, so yeah, that, I think that was like a big, big lesson that we learned. Well, yeah, so, so Sci-Fi International, they're basically, they're, they are the division or the, the, the sub-company of Sci-Fi that handles the rest of the world, and, and that's why they wanted it for those, those commercial gaps. Um, but they're interested in, in VR, and I mean, we, we've all heard about the, the massive interest in China for VR, so, so yeah, the, there was an opportunity there. Um, we still think that there's an opportunity in North America, and we're looking to, to sort of launch here as well, but uh, it just ha so happened that we were there first. Um, and I think the experience was good enough that we would probably consider going there again. We've got about 10 minutes, so any more questions? Uh, oh, yes. You mentioned uh, some of the trouble with bringing in stereoscopic video with yep. models. Um, do you hear cameras or like, you know, stealth cameras and other stuff like that, that there will be an opportunity to kind of mesh shot footage with games and stuff, or do you think it's more about going with someone in the model? So the question is, uh, uh, talking about the, the, the troubles we had with mixing stereoscopic footage shot on a green screen with, with real-time re and rendered uh, environments, uh, and whether or not we think that there's um, a few, yeah, technology. Uh, right. So, so the issue there is whenever you shoot anything stereoscopically, the distance that you shoot it at is the distance that you're, you're displaying it at, and you cannot move the, your point of view. It breaks the illusion because that's just how stereoscopic works. And that's the same for jump camera and everything else. So I would say that the technology that's coming out now for 3D 360 is not going to be beneficial for that sort of mixed um, space. 
But uh, I, I honestly think that the, the uh, market, once it starts to mature, we're going to start to drive innovation in new forms of performance capture. It's already happening. People are already trying to go down that road and experimenting with it. I mean, everyone's heard or hopefully has heard about, like, the, there's developments in light field technology, which is kind of like the way I usually put it is, it's like a camera that works like a microphone. It just sort of takes in all the, the light data in a room and then is able to, to recreate that in a, in a 3D environment. Um, so I think that filming stuff for VR is, is still going to exist in the future, but it's going to really change how we film things. And it's going to be completely different. Uh, whenever I speak at conferences and there's people in the film industry there, like I'll have a, a director of photography come up and say, hey, what do I do? I want, I'm a director of photography. I want to be able to do this for VR. And I say, grab a camera and you tell me because I have no idea. We, we're all just trying to figure it out. Yes? Um, so, so I call it paper prototype, but sometimes it's Lego and cell phone cameras. So we'll put our camera down with the, with the lens closest to the table and we'll build things in, out of Lego and we'll move it around and see how things look. Uh, the paper side of it is usually just like how are we going to do, if we're doing a branching narrative, because like I said, we did consider it at one point giving the audience agency. So we start to just map out stories and see like how far we can go without creating too many branches. But Still experimenting there, like still trying. Like we got to a point there where we said this is too big to be able to tack it all, tackle all in this project, so let's shelve it and we'll bring it back out later. So it's all just about whatever we can to sort of make a, a test. Like for Sleepy Hollow, for instance, we built everything with Unity, um, and we used assets from the Unity store to, to build our first, um, our first iteration. So it was all free assets, and like the Headless Horseman was a skeleton, and we just used random buildings to create the environment, and we just test it, test, test, test. Right. So the question is, um, at Super Location, have we developed uh, a, a process or any kind of um, uh, like models for how we develop our content that make them richer than just uh, video or game, right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, my approach is I always think about uh, the user as being in a real place because uh, watching f uh, content on a screen is very different from watching or being inside of content and that's essentially what VR does. It takes you inside the content. Uh, in, in Halcyon, when we started doing user testing, we realized right away that even though our original conceit was that you're just a fly on the wall, that's how audiences work in VR, everyone that we user tested with uh, gave themselves a persona. And I realized that like, my first experience in a room scale uh, game was um, a job simulator. Hands up, anyone who's tried job simulator? Okay, so essentially you're in a cubicle and you can, like, you can manipulate staplers and photocopiers, which is something that Steph Grambard is actually kind of used to. So when I was in that environment, I didn't have to give myself a persona, I could just be me. But for our audience, or for our, our user testers, being in a sci-fi procedural, a police procedural, is foreign to them. So then they have to ask themselves, well, who am I in this space? And what am I capable of? So um, that, that sort of pr presence leads to questions of identity and agency. So what we try to do is we just try to think of like, how the user is gonna react to, to any kind of environment we put them in. And then for actual like, scripting and storytelling, what we do is, uh, we try to put the, that concept first, right? So um, if you're gonna be a protagonist or if you're gonna be a secondary character following a protagonist, like what is it that your role is while the, the story is moving forward? So it's just, that's really crucial, I think, in VR. Do you have a question?
Uh, so is, is it easier to take virtual reality content and make it international? Um, I think it's the same. It's the same issues we had to do, um, or we worked with Sci-Fi International to get translation done. They have a whole translation department because they're used to working with um, Sci-Fi content from the States. Um, and for us, it was mostly just translating of the, um, the menus in VR. And I would say that it's, yeah, it's no, no more difficult or less difficult, at least in that sort of aspect of it. Um, getting into those markets, I can't really speak to because that was mostly just, we had Sci-Fi International, that's what they do. So <laughs> they were already well-versed in doing that. Cool. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Right, so so in Unity, how do we how do we think about stories and jumping from scene to scene, exactly. right? Exactly. Do you think about the door or like a yep. teleportation? So uh, in Halcyon, we have one location and one scene per episode. So that's how we tackled that with this one. Again, we started thinking about how we would do those jumps and how we would move from location to location, and again said, not only do we not have uh, sort of the the pipeline in place. On the, and the bandwidth to, to think about those problems, but we also didn't have the budget to really create more than this one robust space. And we decided instead of trying to create multiple spaces that may not be as 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 robust as as it would be if we just created the one. You can walk around. You can walk around um, wow. using, n not like Vive, because what we're doing is we're using the Oculus controller, but we did actually design it so that it could be room scale. Initially, we wanted to go out on, onto other platforms and not just stay with the Oculus Rift, but, but we just didn't know what was going to be re released and when, so we sort of released Oculus and Gear VR to start, and then from there we can move on to other ones. Now, we have thought about how we're going to move to different scenes and do scene cuts, but uh, we, haven't, we haven't experimented as much there yet, and that's what we're hoping to do probably with our next project. Anyone else? Uh, all right, great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>